relationship. In this video from IT Free Training, I will look at the relying party trust found in Active Directory Federation Services. The relying party trust determines what data is included in a claim. The terminology for trusts in Active Directory Federation Services may seem backward, so I will first have a quick look at how the Active Directory Federation Trust works before I look at the relying party trust. In our example, IT Free Training has a server running Active Directory Federation Services and so does High Cost Training. In order for IT Free Training to create claims and send them to High Cost Training, there needs to be a relying party trust configured on the IT Free Training side and a claims provider trust configured on the High Cost Training side. This may seem different to what you would expect for the following reasons. If a claim is created in IT Free Training, this claim contains information. For example, it could contain a username, email, or other data. Once the claim is created, it is transferred to the server. Typically, the claim will go to the user, who will present this to the server. But you get the idea that the claim is created and then transferred. So, what does this mean? It means that in order for IT Free Training to create a claim, it needs to know what to put in the claim. So, in order to do this, it needs some configuration information. So, another way to look at it is on the IT Free Training side, you are creating the relying party trust configuration. This configuration determines what will go in the claim. If you were to create the relying party trust on the high cost training side, well, the claim has already been created and cannot be changed afterwards. When high cost training is given a claim, it has to make use of what has been included in it. It cannot ask for additional information afterwards. Any information it needs must be put into the claim. If you are a bit confused by this, it should all start making sense soon. If you look at what a relying party trust achieves, it essentially is the configuration that is used to create claims. A relying party trust is used in the accounts partner organization. In the previous example, IT free training would create a claim that could be used in high cost training. Relying party trusts can also be created in between the federation server and the claim aware application. In a moment, I will have a look at how that one works. Once you configure a relying party trust, it is divided into three sets of rules as shown. These are issuance transform rules, issuance authorization rules, and delegation authorization rules. To get a better idea of how these work, let's look at an example. First, let's consider the Active Directory Federation server in the IT free training domain. This server needs to be configured to create claims to send to the high cost training domain. So, how would you do this? First, you would create a relying party trust on the IT Free Training Federation server. The relying party trust defines the relationship with high cost training. This contains information like what encryption is to be used and defines what functionality is available on the server. But the next point to consider is who will be allowed to use this server to create claims. In a typical environment, you may have authorization determined by a domain controller. In order for this to occur, you need a rule to define it. These rules are called issuance authorization rules and these rules define authorization. In this example, I have used Active Directory to define who can use the server to create claims. However, a rule could be created for just about anything. For example, the rule may state that the user only requires a valid email address. The rule could also query a SQL server to allow access. Multiple rules could also be defined. For example, you could define one rule which allows access only to domain users. However, you could also create a second rule which denies users the ability to connect to a particular IP address. For example, perhaps you only want external users using the server and internal users to be blocked. Now that the user has been authorized, the next step is to determine what information will be sent to the other party in the claim. 
This is the part where you can see how customizable Active Directory Federation services can be. In this example, a SQL Server is used to store data that will be used in the claim. Once the data is obtained, Active Directory Federation services needs to know how this data should be put into the claim. To do this, an issuance transform rule is used. An issuance transform rule essentially converts the data to the form required in the claim. However, it can also be used to change data as required. The authorization rule is pretty straightforward. It defines who has access. Since the issuance transform rule is a little bit more complex, let's look at an example. To start with, Consider what happens when a claim is being created. When a request to create a claim is created, the issuance transform rules are run. In this example, the first rule that is run is get the user's job title. In order to get this information, the attribute store is contacted which contains the job title which that user performs in the company. ADFS uses this information to create the claim. You can see how the issuance transform rule is used to tell ADFS what information should be put into the claim. However, later on, you find out that a user obtained a claim from the Federation server but was not able to access the claims based application. When you investigate the problem, you determine that no job title has been entered in for that user. When you contact high cost training, they tell you the application is hard coded to expect a job title in the claim and it cannot be changed. They also tell you that they do not use this information so you can set the value to whatever you like. It is a lot of effort to make sure all the employees job titles are set correctly and the problem needs to be fixed quickly. So to fix the problem, a second rule is created. This rule states that if the job title is blank, set it to IT free training employee. This way, a value is always set in the claim for the value of job title. You can see how issuance transform rules can be used to determine what information is used in the claim, but also put it in the format that is required. It can take the raw data and transform it to the required state. This is a very powerful feature of Active Directory Federation services. The last rule I will look at is delegation authorization rules. This rule allows a user to be impersonated. To understand why this is important, consider this example. A user wants to access a claims aware application, so they contact an Active Directory Federation server to obtain a claim. Once they have this token, they contact a web server using this claim in order to get the information that they want. Notice that because the user uses that claim to access the application, this can be logged showing that they used the application. The problem occurs in that the information they are after is on a secure SQL Server that only accepts claims for access through a claim aware application. The problem is that the user does not have access to this server, so in order to get this information, the web server obtains a claim using its access and obtains the information for that user on their behalf using impersonation. So essentially delegation authorization rules is pretending to be someone else in order to access another system. To better understand this, consider a real world example. Consider that you have a library. The library purchases an online subscription to a journal. The library is now able to access the online journal. The problem is, how does the library allow the users to access the online journal? If they had direct access, the library would no longer have control over who has access. For example, the users could give the access to other people or they could use it even if they stopped being members of the library. To solve this, the users access the library server, which will then access the online journal for them. You can see how impersonation works. It's about pretending to be someone else or accessing something on their behalf. You will notice with a system like this, although the online journal would not know who is accessing the journal, the library could keep records of this access. There has been a lot covered in this video, so I will perform a quick summary of the major points. 
In order to have a trust relationship in Active Directory Federation Services, you require a relying party trust and a claims provider trust. In this video, I have looked at the relying party trust. The easiest way to remember where this goes is to think of it as configured on the side that creates the claim. If you consider this example, the IT Free Training Active Directory Federation Server creates claims that are used by the High Cost Training Federation Server. For this reason, the relying party trust is configured on the IT Free Training side. Although this may seem opposite to what you expect, remember that the server is creating the claim and is sending it to the other party. For this reason, since it is creating the claim, it needs to know what it is creating. Now also consider that on the high cost training side is a claims aware application. The server uses claims as well. However, it does not use the claims that are created by IT free training. It only accepts claims from high cost training. Typically what happens is when the user presents the claim to the high cost training federation server, the server will create a new claim and give that to the user. The user can use this claim to access the claims aware application. This is the same sort of principle as when you go to a store and purchase an item, but rather than giving you the item, they give you a token. You then use that token to get the product you are after. The important point to remember is that since the server is creating a claim, a relying party trust is required and defines how the claim will be created. Once the claim is created, the claims aware application can use it. The next point to remember is that a relying party trust has three sets of rules associated with it. The issuance authorization rules defines who can create claims. For example, you could have all users with a particular email address or all users in a particular group. The issuance transform rules defines what data is put into the claim. This can be data obtained from a number of different stores like Active Directory, SQL Server, and Active Directory Lightweight Directory Services, to name a few. Remember also that this data can be changed if required. For example, if your usernames ended in .local, you may change the claim to have usernames that end in .com. Lastly, you have delegation authorization rules. These rules allow a user to be impersonated. This will generally be done so data can be fetched for the user that they do not have access to while protecting the initial access. This is normally done so the user does not have direct access and thus improves security. That covers it for relying party trusts. In the next video, I will look at creating a relying party trust. Till that video, thanks for watching and see you.